Well, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be here, and I mean that sincerely. <laughs> As you know, Judy and I missed last uh, Sunday because of uh, some of the symptoms that uh, we were having in our home. Judy especially sort of had those flu-like symptoms, and uh, we were concerned about uh, whether or not it was symptomatic of something other than that. These days... Isn't it true? Every little thing that we're feeling is sort of indicative of uh, something else. So um, we went ahead and got tested, and uh, it came back negative, which we're grateful for. Some of you had that experience already, or maybe will have, but uh, it adds to your peace of mind so that uh, you feel a little bit more secure in having, uh, uh, having some, some uh, sense that you're not contagious which is the thing we wouldn't want to be when we come here. There are some things that are contagious. You know, courtesy is contagious, love is contagious, and so is COVID. But uh, we want to be on the safe side. Well, uh, we have been in a series of messages called Rehearsing the Messiah. And uh, in this series, my goal has been to take this wonderful music of the Messiah and the wonderful texts that are included in the Messiah and uh, just rehearse them together because at this time of year when Christmas music is so essential to our celebration and, uh, and the message of Christmas about Jesus' birth and his life uh, is central to what we're thinking, uh, it's, it's good to be able to just go back over it again. And I think especially this year, it is very important for us to do that. So uh, we've been making our way through the early part of the Messiah from the earliest uh, uh, aria, Comfort Ye My People, and on through some of the choruses this morning, one of the great choruses from the Messiah that we'll be listening to today. I thought I'd say this, of course, about uh, the Messiah because I wanted to say a few things about the work itself and some of the things that are related to it. One of the interesting things, I think, about the Messiah is it's not generally known that uh, in addition to it being a great musical work and one, perhaps the most performed choral work in all of history, it's one of the most outstanding sources for charitable fundraising <laughs> that there's been in history. Now, we're familiar today with a lot of benefit concerts and, and all kinds of uh, relief efforts that are made, sometimes by having uh, musical presentations. And the proceeds of those go to, uh, uh, to certain relief funds. But uh, that was true of the Messiah as well. In fact, it's not often mentioned that the Messiah, as it began in Dublin, Ireland in 1742, it was actually presented as, as a relief effort um, because his first performance, the proceeds went to, um, to freeing debtors from their debtor's prison. 142 uh, men were freed from debtor's prison as a result of that first performance of the Messiah. They paid their, their debt and set them free. Sounds like Jesus, right? <laughs> he paid our debt and set us free. And many of the subsequent performances of Handel's Messiah were for that very purpose. Handel himself conducted over 30 performances that were, uh, that were performed for charity. His favorite charity was the London Foundling Hospital, which was a home for abandoned children and, and orphans. And so much money was raised for that charity over the years that it led one of his biographers to say this. He said, Messiah has fed the hungry, clothed the naked, fostered the orphan more than any other single musical production in this or in any other country. That's pretty important, isn't it? And uh, even today there are presentations of, of the Messiah and the proceeds go toward charities and so on. Of course, we know that Handel's music is undoubtedly his greatest legacy, but also this legacy of giving uh, comes through the Messiah. And uh, I think that's wonderful to, to remember that, that uh, in exalting Jesus as our Messiah, it also shows that we have a care and concern for other people. And that should be our same concern for one another. So just that little bit of information about the Messiah, I think is, is pretty significant uh, to remember. Just this last week, one of my uh, responsibilities at Heritage College and Seminary is to listen to young preachers and to, uh, to kind of give them some, some evaluation and advice. I do that along with a number of others of our online profs and our president, Dr. Rick Reed, 
who was the main instructor in the uh, graduate certificate program in preaching. But I heard one of our young pastors uh, this week say something that, uh, that really made an impression on my heart. He's uh, pastoring in a, in a church where he's the lead pastor, and he announced to his congregation, I think it was a Sunday ago, that he and his wife were expecting another child, which is their second child. And uh, it stands out because uh, in this year of bad news, <laughs> this is a little bit of, of good news. And uh, I think uh, it, was, it was quite a significant thing. And of course, there was a good response from his people. But he made this comment after he said that announcement. And this is what struck me more than anything else. He said that good news is so much better when it comes in dark times. That just, it just really impressed my heart. And uh, I want you to think about that this morning. That good news is so much better, seems so sweeter and so much richer when it comes during dark times. And of course, these are dark times, aren't they? I think we feel it, all of us, all around us. This COVID pandemic, not only uh, as, as it represented a loss of, of health, a loss of life, but it has a lot of other losses associated. Loss of income, loss of peace of mind, loss of family connection, loss of confidence. That's all uh, going on during these times. And when you factor in all of the other things that have gone on this year, things like uh, social and political unrest, there's been so much of that. And I guess there's little that would dispute the fact that 2020 represents dark times. But, but in these dark times that, that we're living in, it's, it's probably no darker, really, than the times that Isaiah the prophet lived in. In fact, as we read from the scriptures today, it gave us an indication of those dark days that were present in Isaiah's time in the seventh century of, of BC Israel. Uh, we, they had the threat of military power of, of the Assyria uh, armies upon them. They were under this dark cloud of this enemy to the north. And all around them was this sense of, of uh, awe and, and uh, darkness, not knowing what the next thing was going to be. And so it was during those times that Isaiah prophesied and gave this word. I want you to turn to that passage that Brother Tom read, us, read to us just a moment ago. And I want you to think about the implication of the darkness and the gloom that Israel felt when uh, these words were penned. Isaiah chapter 9 where it says in verse two, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light and those who dwelled in the land of deep darkness on them has the light shone. It's interesting that in that verse, the word deep darkness is the same word if you remember Psalm 23 when, when uh, David in writing his shepherd's psalm said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, some other versions say, the value of deep darkness. That's the same word, that's the same, the implication. That time when there's threats all around you, where there's danger, where there's the anxiety in, in your heart, that's during that time. And he said the people who were experiencing that, who were walking in darkness, have seen a great light. Isaiah is saying to them, instead of gloom and doom, that you're used to. There's gonna be joy. There's gonna be a time of gladness. And he says it'll be just like the kind of gladness, as he says in verse three, that you have when you, when you have an abundant harvest. It'll be the same kind of joy that you experience when you have a military victory and all of the spoils of war are there and you're able to divide them. Isaiah is saying that's what's coming. You've had, you've had enough of this darkness people who are sitting and living in darkness are gonna see a great light. That light is gonna dawn and there's gonna be no more darkness, but instead there'll be great joy and gladness. And what's gonna bring that about? Notice his words, he says in verse uh, six, for unto us a child is born and a son is given. The birth of a baby is going to signal the coming of that light. This child is going to be a sign of God's light shining upon you, and his name is going to reveal what God is going to do. 
We saw that earlier. Remember in chapter 7, Isaiah said uh, that a child is going to be born, a virgin will conceive and bear a son, call his name Emmanuel. That child will be the sign to Israel that God was with them. And Isaiah is saying here in this chapter as well, there's going to be a baby born among you. He's going to be a ruler, and he will be a sign to you of God's presence with you and God's work in your midst. And just like the name Emmanuel was a signal for what God was going to do, the names that Isaiah says would be given to him are going to signal what God will do among you. Look at them again. We're so familiar to these words, we need to refresh them in our memory. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His name describes the kind of character that he will bring, the kind of rule. He'll be a wonderful counselor. He'll be a leader that is rich in wisdom. He will lead his people wisely. He'll be a mighty God. He'll be the mighty God among you, a leader who rules with God's power. He'll be the everlasting father, a leader who will protect and provide for his own like fathers do for their families. He'll be the prince of peace. He'll be a leader who will bring that, that true meaning of the Hebrew word shalom, which not only means absence of war, it means wholeness and well-being totally. That's the kind of rule that he will have. This child who will, who will be among you will reign with an eternal kingdom, and his kingdom, as it says, will be characterized by righteousness and justice. People were longing for that. And Isaiah says that's what's going to happen in, when this young child comes as your ruler. Good news is so much better when it comes in dark times. And that's what happened when Isaiah brought this word to them. He brought this word of hope. He brought this word that the light is going to shine among you. You know, in the Messiah, the text of the music of the Messiah is perfectly wedded together with the, the music uh, that uh, Handel penned. Because Handel gives the message uh, that, that quality about it. And when you read, uh, when you listen to a portion of the Messiah, we're going to listen to it just for a moment. He begins with this bass solo. We're, we won't hear that part. But the bass solo, which begins, and uh, it begins with Isaiah chapter 60. We didn't read this portion, but here's what it says. For behold, darkness will cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will, will uh, arise upon you and his glory will be seen among you. And nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. The uh, lyricist Charles Jenin took this verse, these two verses from Isaiah 60, and he put them together with these verses from Isaiah chapter 9. And he weds them together and he gives, Handel gives this solo to the bass singer. You usually think of a bass singer as being, you know, pretty rich and full and sometimes dark. And that's what the bass singer is, is like in the Messiah. He says, for behold, darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the people. And that, that kind of low and slow section is, is reminiscent of this very text that we're looking at right now. But then there's a burst of joy. Then there's a chorus that, uh, that sings out with exuberance and exor, exor, exhilaration. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And Handel positioned it in such a way that in characteristic uh, contrast to the darkness that the people were living in, to this burst of light, this burst of joy, it just gives you that wonderful uplifting feeling that there is hope, that there is a, a word of encouragement to people who are living in dark times. I want you to listen to this section now. You'll recognize this chorus. But you'll see how, how uplifting and how joyful this section is. For unto us a child is born. Let's, when we come to this, uh, this passage of Scripture, we realize that we're on the other side of this prophecy, aren't we? All of this was fulfilled. The child was born. The son was given. And his name, wonderful counselor, all of the names apply to him. That is Jesus Christ. 
He's the Messiah. He's the King. He's the one who fulfills all these wonderful promises that Isaiah made so many years ago. And his name says who he is and what he has come to do. His name, of course, wonderful counselor, are the attributes of his character. But his name, Jesus, that was given to him, that was described by the angel who said you will call his name Jesus. His name means Yahweh, God, is salvation. God is the deliverer. He's the redeemer. Jesus is the very presence of God himself. And every name that Isaiah spelled out in this section applies to Jesus. He is a counselor. And his wisdom and his counsel is wonderful. It's matchless. No one ever spoke like Jesus spoke. No one ever taught like Jesus taught. He came to reveal the very will of God. His counsel, his wisdom is wonderful. And he is God himself. He is the mighty God. He's all-powerful. He's invincible. Jesus Christ himself is God here in the flesh. And all of his power and majesty was displayed in his life. He is the father. He is the head of a new family, the eternal father, the eternal king. He is the prince of peace. He is the heir to the father's throne and the giver of true peace. There's so much joy in, in music like that, and it, it really does exhibit the exuberance and the exhilaration that was uh, so typical of this text in Isaiah. Good news, coming to people in their darkness, in their dark times. You know, I was reminded this week uh, of a situation that many of you will remember. It happened in Thailand back in the early summer of 2018. You remember that just over two years ago now? 12 members of that boys uh, football, we would call it a soccer team, and their coach, they went exploring in those caves in northern uh, in Thailand, in the Chi Chiang Rai province. And they had done that several times before, so they weren't afraid to go back into those caves. They explored there numerous times, and uh, they would go from one section to another, and as a, as a group, they would share that experience. But this was a different experience for them, because this time, it was during the rainy season, and the heavy rains were coming in, and the, the floodwaters were beginning to rise in, in those chambers in, in that uh, cave system. And it resulted in the fact that they, the, these waters were filling up the sections behind them. So these boys had to retreat farther and farther back into the cave to keep from being uh, inundated by this, by this flood. They found themselves deep inside that cave, probably more than eight kilometers back in the cave. And they had to sit there. They had to stay there in the darkness. One night passed, and they huddled together and, and, and trying to keep each other warm, hoping that these waters would subside. And then another night passed, and another day, and day after day. They had no food. They, they only had water from the rocky walls that kind of seeped in around them. And outside of this cave were their parents and family members and so many people who knew about it who were hoping and praying that they could be safe from this, uh, this threat to their lives. They sent in the elite Thai seals were like uh, uh, some of the uh, rescuers that would dive and, and would have uh, special skills. But they didn't find any signs of life. And when the situation became more and more dangerous, they just had to give up. And then uh, there were those who were aware of this, some international rescuers, people who were skilled in cave diving. And they began, they began coming in and offering their uh, assistance and saying that, you know, we'll do everything that we can to help. It was on about the ninth day of their being trapped in this cave, that two British divers who had pressed farther into this cave system than any others had been able to do up to that point, they came under the, a deep section of water and surfaced in that pocket of water. And when they came to the surface, they looked out and shone the light that they had. And what did they see? Well, they saw a group of boys that were sitting on this muddy bank 
they, they saw when they shone their light, these young faces that were illuminated. And uh, one of the men, it, it's, they took a video of that at the moment when they discovered them. And they called out to these boys and said, how many of there are, are you? And the boys, one who could speak English, responded, 13. That was all of them, 12 boys in their coach. They were cold, they were hungry, they were afraid, but they were alive. <laughs> and they sent back word, of course, the, the divers to their families. They couldn't bring them out at that moment because of the danger of going through the floodwaters, oh, this system after system of these parts of the cave. But they were alive. And they reported that word back to those who were so concerned about them. And of course, after that time came this dangerous part of rescuing these boys, bringing them through the waters. Many of them couldn't even swim. And they had to have the, the masks on and the tanks and uh, divers on one side and the other had to bring these boys out one by one. But they did bring them out and they were all safe, <laughs> miraculously. You know, I think of that climactic moment when those two divers appeared out of the water and they shone their light on these boys. And I think of this text. <laughs> the people who were in darkness have seen a great light. Can you imagine the relief those boys and their coach received when they recognized that they had been found, that there was hope for them, that someone was there to rescue them, that someone was there to bring them back home? safely once again. My friends, I want you to think about the fact that that is exactly what Jesus was sent to do for us. Jesus was sent on a rescue mission for you and me. Now you may not have realized it, but you were sitting in darkness. So was I. I was just a young boy when Jesus found me and yet I recognized there was something about my own understanding of who I was and what I was like that I knew I was in darkness. Many of you would say, yeah, I knew it too. I knew when Jesus found me that I needed somebody to come to my rescue. Somebody who would save me, somebody who would bring me out of my dangerous situation, who would bring me back to a place of safety in life again. And when you saw that light of the gospel, it was like a light shining on you. And you were able to see, whereas once you were blind to your need and to the truth of, of God's work for you, yet now you understood there was something that came upon you, that you saw that light and it made sense. Do you remember that time? Have you had that experience in your life? Often our, our songs reflect in that. Once I was blind, but now I can see. I think of a hymn that I used to sing as a young boy. It's called The Light of the World is Jesus. And it talks about uh, the, the light that shines upon us. And, uh, and when, when we recognize the, the light of Jesus in our life, it just dispels the darkness. It makes sense that we are sitting in darkness in our sins and we have a need for somebody to rescue us. And Jesus is that rescuer. His very name says who he is. He's our savior. What does it mean to be saved? <laughs> Maybe I've told you this before, but as, as a counselor at a Bible camp one summer when I asked the boys under my charge, have they been saved? Many of them said, well, yes, I was saved. I said, when were you saved? How were you saved? One would say, well, my, my mother led me to uh, faith. I prayed with her. My dad prayed with me. I prayed with the Sunday school teacher. And I was eight years old or 10 years old. This one little boy in my cabin, when I asked him, he said, well, I was saved when I was three. And I said, well, that's interesting. Tell me about it. You were three years old? Yes, I was three. I said, well, how are you saved? He said, well, my dad and I were out in the boat fishing. And I leaned over and fell in the water. And my dad reached over and picked me up, and I was saved. <laughs> and I, well, that's, you know, it was cute. But you know what I thought about that? I thought he knew more about what is me meant to being saved than a lot of people do. What does it mean to be saved? It's, it's to be rescued from the danger that you're in. 
It's to be pulled out of your situation because if you don't get rescued from that situation, you will drown. So you need somebody to de deliver you, somebody to bring you out of your darkness, somebody to lift you up and bring you to himself. And that's exactly who Jesus is. He's the one who was sent into this world as the light. John in his gospel in the first chapter talked about that light that was coming into the world. And that light is Jesus. And he said that light is coming to the world and the darkness has never been ever able to overcome it. The light of the world has been shining in this dark world for all these many years. It came in the person of Jesus as a little baby and that light has been shining century after century and it reached you if you are a believer it has reached me in my younger years and it is still shining to reach other people now there are a lot of people who don't recognize they're in the darkness they don't even know it it's like you know kind of living in a situation like being in a, a fish in water you don't understand your condition but when the, the light shines upon you and the light dawns upon your heart, you recognize that you do have a need to be rescued and saved. And when that light opens your mind, it allows you to see your need for a savior. And that's when you call on the Lord. That's when you say, Lord, I recognize without you, I am lost. I will never be able to stand before God. I will have to spend eternity in darkness separated from you. But Jesus is the rescuer. He's like that shepherd, that good shepherd that goes out looking for his lost sheep. And when he finds the lost sheep, he brings it back in to the safety of the fold. That lost sheep is you. That lost sheep is me. We need a rescuer, a redeemer, a savior. And that's the message of Christmas, <laughs> that God sent that redeemer, that savior. And as a light, he came into this world, into this dark world, and it shines in the darkness. And it's still shining even now. I wonder, can you say of a certainty this morning that that light has shone in your heart? Can you point to a time in your life when you say yes, my eyes were open to my need and I called out on Jesus and I said, Lord Jesus, I believe in you, I trust in you. I want you to be my savior, my redeemer, my deliverer. And you were saved, <laughs> saved from your sin, saved from the pen penalty and the punishment of your sin. And you now belong to God and his family and you are rescued. But you know, my friends, we're still in the process of being rescued even now, aren't we? Our salvation is not just a past event. It's a present experience that we are being delivered right now. Those boys, you might say, were saved when the divers appeared and shone their light at them and saying, you know, we know where you are. But there was the rescue that took place in between. And we are who are saved by the trusting in Jesus and his sacrifice, are now being saved at this very moment. We are in the process of the work of God's salvation in our life. He is purifying us. He is cleansing us. He is making us ready for that time when ultimately we will be saved in the final total sense of the word. We will be redeemed. Even your very body will be redeemed and saved. What a good piece of news that is. You will live forever. You will live in eternity with your Father God, with the Lord Jesus Christ. You will be forever at home and rescued at that moment. Oh, my friends, good news is so much better when it comes in dark times. And this message of the gospel is shining in this world today, in this dark world. And people whom God is calling to himself, are responding and are coming to faith in him. I wonder if, if you have never yet responded to the message of the gospel. I want you to know that today that light is shining for you. 
That light is shining so that you might be able to see who Jesus is and so that you might call upon him to be your rescuer, your savior, and to pull you out of danger and bring you into his family and into security and carry you forward through the rest of your life until Jesus comes again and brings the fullness of his salvation. If you've never called on the Lord for salvation, oh, do it today. Open your heart and say, Lord Jesus, come in and be my savior. He will deliver you. If you have known him because you have received him as your savior, rejoice today that that light is still shining. And my friends, it is shining through you if you are a believer. Because Jesus said, now you are the light of the world. You're the one who bears the message, carries the, the good news of the gospel so that you can tell people they don't have to die and go to hell and pay for their own sins when Jesus has already paid the penalty, when Jesus has made it possible for them to come to faith and be saved. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder and his name is Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, in this joyful Christmas time, we rejoice in the reality of this message, that good news has come. Father, I pray for everybody listening here in this room, those who may be listening later. I pray there will be no one who will have a doubt in their mind about whether or not they have been rescued and delivered from their sin. Lord, for all of us who have prayed to receive you, who have opened our hearts and recognized by your light shining on our lives that, that we have been needy in our, in our own sinful state and that we have needed a savior. Thank you for calling us to you. Oh Lord, I'm grateful today. I speak for all of us who have prayed to receive you. Thank you for coming after us. Thank you for not leaving us alone to perish in our darkness. Thank you that you revealed the light of your truth. And I pray, Lord Jesus, even this very moment for anyone here or anyone listening later who has never yet responded to the light of the gospel, help them today, draw them by your spirit, open their eyes. We know that the, the God of this world has blinded the eyes of many lest the light of the gospel should shine to them. But Lord, open the eyes today of someone who just would say, Lord Jesus, I know that you came to rescue me. Be my savior, be my salvation, I pray. And Lord, I thank you for the ministry of this church. I thank you for the gospel that has gone out from this pulpit, from this church for these many years. I pray that it will continue and as our dear new pastor will be coming very soon, we pray that his ministry will be a continuation of the, the clarion call of the truth of the gospel, that Jesus, the light of the world, has come, and that he is offering salvation to all who would believe. Help us to be faithful, exp expressing that message until you come again. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.